Support for this podcast comes from Progressive. What would you do with an extra $800? Buy a plane ticket? Pay down your student loan? Treat yourself to those shoes you've been eyeing? With Progressive, you could find out. Drivers who switch and save, save an average of $796 on car insurance. Get your quote online at Progressive.com and see how much you could be saving. National average annual car insurance savings by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive in 2019. Empire. Welcome to Inside the Cap. I'm your host, Joel Corey. You can find me on Twitter at Corey Joel, C-O-R-R-Y-J-O-E-L. Also, you can read my regular CBSSports.com column, Agents Take, on NFL Salary Cap and Contract Matters. Uh, This week, we're going to look at two things. Uh, One, the most logical candidate to become the highest paid non-quarterback in NFL history, and also a little uh, what-if scenario um, regarding Derrick Henry. So let's uh, get started on where the non-quarterback market is going to head uh, this offseason. Right now, the highest paid non-quarterback in new money is DeAndre Hopkins at $27.25 million per year. Right behind him is Joey Bosa, the Chargers defensive end. He signed a five-year, $135 million extension, averaging $27 million per year in early August. Uh, has a record $78 million fully, uh, fully guaranteed at signing for a non-quarterback and $102 million in total guarantees. Now, the guy I think is going to top all non-quarterbacks when it's all said and done will be T.J. Watt. T.J. Watt, 2017 first-round pick, is heading into his fifth-year option. For the fifth-year option, he's scheduled to make $10.089 million. T.J. Watt, leading candidate to be Defensive Player of the Year, led the NFL with um, 15 sacks. Um, it's probably going to go to either T.J. Watt or Aaron Donald. Um, over the past three years... Uh, T.J. Watt has 42.5 has 42.5 sacks. Second, Aaron Donald's 43.6. If you look at where Watt was and Joey Bosa through the first four years, Bosa came in in 2016, year ahead. Durability issues with Bosa's had some injuries. Um, 40 sacks in 51 games, uh, season high 11.5 in 2019. Watt this year, career high. 15, leading the league, 49.5 sacks in 62 games. Um, First team All-Pro this year and last year. Bosa's only first team All-Pro honors came last year. Now, if you look at what the type of increase was, um, Bosa over the next guy, which was Miles Garrett. Miles Garrett became the first $25 million per year non-quarterback in the in NFL history. And the ink was barely dry on his contract before um, Bosa uh, overtook him. That's an 8% increase. Uh, Garrett, that's an average average salary, $27 million to $25. Um, Bosa overtook it from Cleo Mack, which was a two-year-old deal um, by the time um, Garrett signed his. And that was basically a six uh, six point four percent increase. It went from twenty three twenty three point five million, which was what uh, Khalil Max deal averaged to twenty five. So, if I'm T.J. Watt, I want to try to become the first thirty million dollar per year non quarterback. That's that's a kind of a steep uh, increase to have uh, to go from defensive player. 30 to 27, we're talking 11.1%. So I don't think Pittsburgh's going to quite get there. But but there are a couple things we are going to see in this deal. Um, Pittsburgh, like Cincinnati, like Green Bay, uh, don't do deals like everybody else that 
typically you got deals of this magnitude that the first, at least the first two years are fully guaranteed at signing. And if the third year isn't fully guaranteed at signing, then the third year guarantee is going to vest early. Meaning, we'll say in, his, in this case, the third year would be 2023. That guarantee, if it's not fully guaranteed at signing, would be guaranteed for entry at signing. And then the skill and salary cap guarantees would kick in third or fifth day of the 2022 league year. That's not what these three teams do. The only guaranteed money in Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, and Green Bay deals is a signing bonus. Um, They do have unsecured third or fifth day roster bonuses where most of the money in years two, years three, and certainly occasionally year four are in these third to fifth day, third to fifth day roster bonuses. Either you get uh, it's payable on the third day or either the fifth day of the league year, but they're not secured. So you could actually technically cut the guy before the roster bonuses do. And that happened to Nick Perry a couple of years ago. Um, so didn't have the same guarantees as you would in, in a contract with the other 29 teams, but the roster bonus, he didn't get it, got cut. So there are a couple of exceptions um, with these teams. Cincinnati makes none. Pittsburgh's made one exception. That's with Ben Roethlisberger. He's had injury guarantees, not skill and cap, just injury guarantees in his contracts that nobody else has. T.J. Watt's not a quarterback. Don't see them making that exception for him. Green Bay makes one huge exception. The only guy who gets a conventional contract in terms of guarantees, that's Aaron Rodgers. When Clay Matthews, several years ago, became the highest paid um, non-quarterback, or not non-quarterback, um, at the time, pass rusher, or linebacker, I should say, he didn't have any guarantees at all. So I don't think Pittsburgh's going to treat uh, T.J. Watt any differently than anybody else who isn't named Ben Roethlisberger. So what you're going to have to do, most likely, is give him the biggest signing bonus in history for a non-quarterback in order to compensate um, for the lack of guarantees. And right now the largest signing bonus for a non-quarterback was in Aaron Donald's deal. Um, the deal Aaron Donald signed to become the first $20 million per year non-quarterback, which uh, Khalil Mack passed several days later, averaged $22 million per year and $40 million signing bonus. That is the largest signing bonus for a non-quarterback. So since you're not going to have the traditional guarantees, you're probably going to have to have the biggest signing bonus in history. Um, in terms of the first three new years, Joey Bosa has $87.64 million. So it wouldn't surprise me if T.J. Watt's first three new years got him to 90, but the overall deal got him to 90, so that's $30 million per year, or a little bit more than that. But the deal overall, I don't think, gets to 30. So where do I think it's going to end up? Now, If you, I don't think it's below $28.5 million. Um, I don't think there's any way possible that you're going to get a deal done with T.J. Watt for under that. But if you're talking the same increase that Bosa got over Miles Garrett, then you're getting in the territory of $29.25 million. And if you're talking the same type of increase that Miles Garrett got over Khalil Mack, then you're talking like $28.75 million where the average is going to end up. And that, that's the new money average. And don't forget that when we talk about extensions, the negotiation is over the new years and the new money. So, yeah, if he did a four-year extension, I wouldn't do any more than four years, new years, if I'm T.J. Watt. Then you're talking five years. He's total under contract. The fifth-year option is the fifth-year option, so you're negotiating the money on top of that fifth-year option. Um, That's how these work. So if you're talking record signing bonus, and he's got a $10.089 million fifth-year option, don't expect the Steelers Steelers to get a whole lot of cap relief 
on this deal if it's structured the way I think it's probably going to be structured. Um, because T.J. Watt's league minimum as a fourth-year player, a guy who's got four credited seasons going to his fifth year, is 990000 next year. And say you do the four-year extension, you got the one year left, so you can prorate the signing bonus over five years. If you tied it at $40 million, then that's $8 million on the proration right there for signing bonus. That's $8 million on proration right there for signing bonus. And you put on that um, a $990,000 league minimum salary, then you're, you're automatically talking – Eight million nine hundred ninety thousand, as what his cap number would be, just to have the same signing bonus as Aaron Donald. Now, I suspect signing bonus might end up like between, we'll say, forty-two five and forty-five uh, million. And the proration at forty-two point five is eight five a year. Obviously, at forty-five, it's nine million per year. So. If you give T.J. Watt the $42.5 million signing bonus and you drop his base salary not to the 990, because since you got the 10.089, sometimes you see the team want to uh, put the 89 at the uh, into the uh, base salary, so it would be 1.089 million possibly um, is the base with the 85 signing bonus. Um, that's going to put the uh, cap number, in that case, at $9.589 million. That's only a $500,000 cap savings if you do that uh, for the uh, first-year base salary. So you're not going to get a ton of money um, in cap relief on a T.J. Watt deal. But I do fully expect him to become the highest-paid non-quarterback uh, in the NFL in recap. Guarantees aren't going to be remotely close to anybody else's, the, like in a conventional contract. So he's not going to be anywhere near the $78 million fully guaranteed. It's signing the $102 million total guarantees of Joey Bosa. The only true guaranteed money will be the signing bonus. That'll be like $42.5 million, I think. Four-year extension, I think he can get to $29 million per year, but I think he falls short of getting to the $30 million uh, per year mark. The, you kind of like this guy, but when you can't decide between the filet of fish <laughs> um, or the Big Mac, and he says... I'll get you both. Thank you. You definitely <laughs> yeah, like this guy meal. Get it at McDonald's when you get two of your faves for just five bucks. Limited time only. Prices and participation may vary. Single item at regular price. Okay, let's look at this Derrick Henry uh, situation I mentioned. Um, when Derrick Henry became the eighth player to hit the 2,000-yard mark, one of my first thoughts was... What if he played on the franchise tag and not signed a long-term deal when he's coming off of an extremely heavy usage year? He had 378 carries, got to the uh, 2,000 yard mark, and I was like, man, that would that would be quite an interesting situation you would have set up if that had happened. Um, Henry had 2,027 um, yards, fifth most, fifth highest total in NFL history. Also led the league in uh, rushing touchdowns. Um, The Baltimore Ravens were able to bottle him up uh, on Sunday um, in a way that nobody's done since late in the 2018 season. His uh, 40 rushing yards on 18 rushing attempts, that was his lowest rushing total since then. He had the $10.287 million franchise tag this year. And signed a four-year, $50 million contract with $25.5 million fully guaranteed. That's the first two years of the contract. Um, there's another million in incentives, $500,000 in the third year. And also the fourth year, 2022 and 2023, where if he hits 1,300 rushing yards uh, that year, then he earns a five hundred thousand dollar incentive. So deal max is at fifty one million over over four years. So if he played on the franchise tag, and and Tim Owens, first thing I want to say is typically you go out and have a one of the best seasons in history uh, at your position. Typically, you raise your market value for a running back. That's where it gets tricky, particularly with the high usage, the fact that. Uh, running backs have a shorter shelf life. 
at what point would diminishing returns set in? But we do know, pretty safe to say, that Derrick Henry plays on one franchise tag, and I'm going to assume that he would have been like Le'Veon Bell and played through the first one and not kind of try to manage himself. With like, well, i got to preserve my body because I play this position, which has a higher risk of, of diminishment and injury, but he plays it straight and gets to 2,000 yards. Uh, then they were going to be looking at a franchise tag, a second one, at $12,333,600. So I'm going to assume they, they put the franchise tag on because you can't let them get away at that point. But now here's where it gets tricky. If you look at the eight, the seven other running backs who um, hit 2,000 yards, um, that's Eric Dickerson, has the record at 2,105 yards. Uh, Adrian Peterson, Jamal Lewis, Barry Sanders, Terrell Davis, Chris Johnson, and O.J. Simpson. If you throw uh, the average age of these guys first, it's not like they're old, was... Uh, 25.4 years, so when they did it. So that's 25 years and five months, basically, was their average age in the season when they hit 2,000 uh, yards. O.J. Simpson had the fewest amount of carries at 332, but only played 14 games because that it was a 14-game season, which is remarkable that he hit 2,000 yards in 14 games. Now, what we do see with these guys is the next year, <laughs> there's a sharp decline. So going into 2021, if Derrick Henry follows what these guys did, decline is a little surprising. That the seven guys, um, Terrell Davis got hurt, and that was the beginning of the end of his career after the injuries. If you throw him out of the equation, the other six guys, Eric Dickerson didn't play all 16 games, neither Adrian Peterson. Jamal Lewis played 12. Dickerson and Peterson missed two. Barry Sanders played every game. Uh, Chris Johnson played every game, and O.J. Simpson played every game that season. But the average decline of those six guys was 807 rushing yards in the season immediately following the 2,000-yard year. That is a huge decline. So that would have been interesting to see how that would be factored into negotiation, knowing that, as you know, Tennessee, if their analytics department would be looking at that, like, okay, what would we expect? Because you pay somebody – on what you expect them to do on a go-forward basis, not for pass production. So that would have been interesting to see. But that's something to keep an eye on. Is Derrick Henry going to defy the odds or have that typical decline? Because the most yards out of any of these guys um, the year after was Barry Sanders with 1,491 yards. That is the most out of the 2,000-yard club the season following. And then if you look what happened the next year, Eric Dickerson had a huge bounce-back year. He, he went from 1,234 to 1,821. Peterson, second year, because you'd, you'd have to look out what you would do in year two as well if you're, the, if you're the Titans. That's the year where he was on the commissioner's exempt permission list, so he only played one game. Um, Jamal Lewis barely cracked 1,000 yards the first time, got 900 the second year. Barry Sanders retired, played one more year than retired. Uh, Terrell Davis, no more knee problems, so not good. Chris Chris Johnson, 1,364 yards and 1,047. O.J. Simpson, um, 1,125. Then bounce back for 1,817. Now, one interesting thing about O.J. Simpson, 14 games. If he played 16 games, he'd have been in the 2,000-yard uh, club twice if he sustained the pace of production in that second year after the first, after the 2,000-yard year. He'd have broken it twice, but uh, track record's not pretty uh, after you have the 2,000-yard season. So knowing that looming over the equation, it, uh, it would have been interesting to see how much more Henry would have gotten than the deal he actually signed. And if you look at what the Titans did, his average salary uh, at 12.5 was 21.6% over um, the franchise tag. I don't know if that would have applied in this situation, but if you did, then that would get Henry to $15 million. He was not going to, I, This year wouldn't have taken him to the Christian McCaffrey territory. McCaffrey's the highest paid running back, and it's slightly over $16 million per year on the four-year four extension he did. 
in April before the NFL draft. And that's kind of a cautionary tale as well for a running back. you got to strike while the iron's hot. So I'm not suggesting that Henry made a mistake by not signing a deal. Um, I'm just kind of looking at, well, if you had to have this negotiation this year after the, after this monster year, how it would how would it have played out? But McCaffrey wouldn't have helped his cause because McCaffrey ends up for the first time in his career getting hurt. He'd been an Iron Man the last two years, had never really came off the field, had over 90% play time in 2018 and 19, and then this year barely plays because of a multitude of injuries. So he wouldn't get there. He wouldn't become the highest paid running back uh, even after this year because you'd be looking at what he would do in the future. And that would give the Titans some hesitation. And I think Henry may have been in Le'Veon Bell territory where, hey, I'm not going to play in a second franchise tag. But for, So let's assume they actually do come to an agreement. If you do the 21.6% over, the second franchise tag, that's going to get you $15 million, which is where Alvin Kamara's deal is. Granted, it's a backloaded 15 where he's never going to see the last year because there's $25 million in that fifth year, so you can, or the extension, so you can forget that, so cosmetically it's really like 12-5. But let's say they did that with Henry, and 51% of the deal is fully guaranteed, then if $15 million per year, then you're probably going to get, you'd guarantee 30.5 and the last two years would be unsecured. So we're talking 60 over four possibly is what Derrick Henry may have gotten had he waited. But it, but again, I'm not saying he made a mistake. Running back, you got to strike while the iron's hot because too many things can go wrong with a running back. You're not a left tackle where you can play until you're in your late 30s like Andrew Whitworth and have a chance to sign two lucrative contracts after your rookie contract you got one shot so you, you when you since you can get there you get there so Derek Henry did the right thing I'm just looking at what this scenario would have looked like had he played under the franchise tag this year so we're talking like 60 over 4 30.5 fully guaranteed if you fit it in the structure and paradigm of the current deal but the one main takeaway from all this, from the data, keep an eye on for next year for Derrick Henry, how much of a decline is he going to have? One, because of the heavy usage year, and two, if you look at the, the trajectory of what happens with guys in the 2,000-yard club, that first year afterwards, there's a sharp decline, 807-yard decline. So for Henry, if that holds true for him, that's 1,220 rushing yards still would have been among the league leaders this year. I think they would have had him third in the NFL this year. And the most of any of those guys, Barry Sanders, 1,491 yards year after hitting the 2,000 yard club. So let's see if Derrick Henry can defy the odds, but the evidence in the deck seems stacked against him. Hey there, you're up for getting down with low prices, right? Well, Kroger goes lower than low on food that's fresher than fresh. So when you're crushing on clementines, seeking a savory salad, or choosy about your chicken, just open the Kroger app. You'll get more ways to save on the fresh you love with personalized coupons, weekly sales, and rewards like fuel points, all for prices that are even lower than the everyday low. So go where you know it's lower than low. Kroger, fresh for everyone. That is going to be this week's episode of Inside the Cap. You can, as I said, you can find me on Twitter at Corey Joel, that's C-O-R-R-Y, J-O-E-L. And look for my regular CBSSports.com column, Agents Take. Uh, thanks for listening, and we'll see you back uh, next week. Goodbye.